The 2021 Iowa legislative session begins only days from now. But what is on the agenda for another year of Republican control of the House, the Senate, and the governorship? We'll sit down with Iowa Speaker of the House Pat Grassley and Iowa Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitford on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, January 8th edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. After the Republican wave election in 2016, Iowa government began an era of Republican control in November. Despite President Trump's loss in the national election, Republicans in Iowa had a strong night, solidifying at least two more years of Republican trifecta control. But what is left on the conservative agenda and how much can be done as the nation looks to recover from a global pandemic? Joining us today are Republican leaders, Iowa House Speaker Pat Grassley of New Hartford and Iowa Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitfer of Ankeny. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Good to see you back. Thank you. Good to be here. Journalists across the table are Aaron Murphy, Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises, and Kay Henderson is News Director at Radio Iowa. Senator Whitber, let's begin with this, however. Uh, what is your reaction to what happened Wednesday in our nation's capital? Yeah, it was, it was really a sad day um, for this country. Um, violence should always be condemned, and um, this is a great country that has given me so much and given all of us so much. Um, allowed me to grow up in Grinnell, um, go play football at Iowa State, become a state senator, and it's a great country. And um, violence like that should never, should never stand and should always be condemned. Speaker Grassley? Uh, I, I would agree with Jack, and, and the same thing that we've been saying for the last eight months with any sort of uh, protest going on around the country, you should have the right to obviously express your opinions in a nonviolent way, a non-threatening way. Um, uh, hope this is not the way that this country is moving towards. We need to see, be able to express your opinion uh, without having violence. And I would say uh, I've been very consistent on what, even going back into the summer that that's not the proper way to do it. There's a proper way to do it. And what we've seen the last eight months isn't always it. What preparations are being made at the Iowa Capitol? Should similar protests break out in our Capitol? Well, as you know, so the doors are locked other than the secure entrance. We have secure entrances, and then we have uh, security guards that bring people uh, in and out of the entrances we have for the public. We also have state troopers at the building. When we returned in June, you know, we faced some of that. Uh, last, uh, on our return in June, we faced some of that. We just had an increased presence, and I think that between the security that we have in the Capitol and then the state patrol as well, I think that we're well equipped, and I think some of what we saw in June, if it were to be anything like that, that kind of prepared us and know some of the steps that may need to happen. Senator Woodford, do you have any concern that this incident will <clears throat> be seared in the minds of Americans and could hurt Republicans moving forward in, in either advancing agenda or, or in, in elections? I think this is a small group of people that, that went and acted, and I don't think it, they speak for Republicans in general and certainly doesn't speak for what we want to do as an agenda. You know, part of the reason we've been successful here in Iowa with our elections, uh, in the House, in the Senate, with the governor, um, is because we focused on Iowa and we focused on what we need to do to make Iowa the best state we can, and that's what we're going to continue to do. How worried are you, uh, <clears throat> Senator Woodford, about a copycat uh, situation uh, in Iowa is what happened in Michigan. Uh, this episode in Washington could trigger other uh, groups to get a little carried away. 
Uh, are, are you concerned about that? I'm not. Um, uh, we know Iowans. Iowans are respectful. That's not how we operate as Iowans. And as the speaker said, um, as far as the security goes, um, we've had we've had protests for the last four years at the Capitol. We've had some very active debates, um, some very lively debates, um, some lively protests. Uh, we've had riots outside the Capitol. Um, we have beefed up security over the last few years, and so I am not concerned about that. Mr. Speaker, you're starting a session in the middle of a pandemic. What role, if any, does the legislature have in speeding up the process of getting shots of the vaccine in Iowans' arms? Well, you mean from the standpoint of legislators specifically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that, uh, like everyone else, we should be a part of the rollout in order. I don't think the legislators should be jumping ahead of anyone in line. Obviously, the department is handling uh, the rollout and who is uh, going to be in that line, but I don't think legislators should be jumping to the front of the line by any means. So do you think that the legislature has a role in providing more money, um, clarifying which groups should get the vaccine? Well, I and, and to be consistent for the last several, you know, going back all the way back into March, we've tried to rely on the experts that have the knowledge. You know, I, I'm just a sand farmer from New Hartford. I've told you that a hundred times. I don't have that necessarily, that expertise. If there's more funding that is needed to roll that out, I think we need to have that conversation. But as far as us putting our thumb on the scale of who we think, personally, I would like to rely on the experts. Senator Whitford, Congress is getting vaccinated for a continuity of government issue. Is there a continuity of government issue in your mind in Iowa? Well, what we've done is we've asked legislators who feel like they're in those vulnerable populations to um, submit their names and get in line with every other Iowan. I know myself, uh, I'm not going to jump to the front of the line. I think there's other populations and people in Iowa that that need to get the vaccine before I do. And so I'm not going to do that at this time. But there are some members of our um, Senate, some members of the House that are vulnerable, that um, should consider that vaccine. And so we're going through that process right now. And I would just add on to that. <clears throat> that was a policy that the House and Senate had as we had the members share that determination. So again, it wasn't Senator Whitford and I saying who we thought, Republican, Democrat, whatever it is. We wanted our members to submit that to the Department of Public Health to share what level of risk they felt they had. So talking still about the ways that legislators may address the pandemic this session, I know there are members in both of your caucuses who have expressed concern that uh, they feel, um, in their opinion, too much authority was ceded to the executive office and, and maybe the state public health department in responding to this pandemic. Uh, let's start with you, Senator Whitfer. Um, do you agree with that sentence, uh, sentiment, pardon me, and do you expect any legislation uh, that would in some way curtail uh, the executive branch's authority in, in addressing a pandemic? whether it be closing businesses or churches? Well, I think Iowans across the state and, and Americans across the country have had an extremely difficult year. And I'm not sure that anyone's had a more difficult year than governors um, in this country and the decisions they have to make every day, um, sometimes with not nearly the information they need to make those decisions. Um, and they're trying um, to, to make those decisions very quickly. And so I commend Governor Reynolds on a quick, decisive action, um, trying to balance the various interests of, of this pandemic. And um, I, I applaud the work that she's done. Um, I know there's concerns about um, those types of executive powers with some members, but there's a time and a place to address it. And in the middle of a pandemic is a really difficult time to have that conversation and try to change executive powers. And Speaker just, I mean, I'll bring you uh, into the conversation we have within our caucus. Uh, I think there's a total agreement. The governor's done a tremendous job of managing that. There wasn't a playbook uh, that we had to work with. The governor didn't have a playbook to work with that you can look back to another situation. And uh, just I think the sentiment in the caucus that uh, at least House Republicans is there will be a time for us to all review all, you know, all the way probably from the governor down to the legislature, everything that we've made for decisions collectively or individually. And I'm just not convinced that right now is the right time. But when we're ready to have those conversations, I think we're all ready to engage in what those are. Senator Whitver, in mid-December, you told me that you would like as Senate Republicans to be aggressive in tax cuts. Have you flushed that out more in the past few weeks? Um, we're working on that. You know, tax conversation is one that usually takes the entire session. Um, we know the governor brought out a, a rolled out a tax bill last year that we started to work on. Um, 
I expect her to continue to have that conversation and possibly roll something out in her state of the state address. But um, the tax conversation and tax changes don't happen in a bill filed day one in the legislature usually. So um, what I know is as long as I'm majority leader and as long as we're in the majority, we want to continue to improve the tax climate in the state of Iowa. And so uh, we'll work within the budget, we'll work within um, the legislative process, but we do want to continue to improve the tax climate here in Iowa. Iowa is in a pretty strong position um, considering the pandemic, considering the, the struggles in the economy, uh, because of a lot of, the, a lot of the changes that we have made over the last few years. And so um, we don't want to take our foot off the gas with continuing to improve the state of Iowa. Speaker Grassley, uh, the man who's in charge of the tax writing committee in the House said, hey, in December, maybe we should wait and see how the pandemic plays out, what happens with farm policy and farm payments in the Biden administration. Are you in a more go slow process in the House compared to what's happening in the Senate? Well, I would say uh, to Senator Whitford's uh, um, statement, tax policy is, a, is an entire work through the entire session. Not only that, we got to see what the March revenue estimate looks like. I can tell you that I think the priority in our caucus is making sure whatever decision we make does not affect the 2018 tax cut that we passed. When we passed that, we implemented that uh, with triggers and stuff to make sure that if there was something unforeseen, like we find ourselves in now, that our tax cuts could be fully implemented that we passed in 2018. So I would say our priority is going to be that. But I think that we want to be a part of that conversation. We are going to, we're seeing higher than expected revenue growth. If we have have those opportunities to return dollars back to the uh, hardworking Iowans. We want to do that, but I think uh, our priority is going to make sure that whatever decision we make does not jeopardize the current tax cut. Senator Whitford, uh, is this a time for maybe doing nothing? A recession is no time to be raising taxes when you're in a recessionary environment, the way some people want to do with the sales tax. But you're in also in a period where you need the revenue. You've had some cutbacks in revenue. So is it really a time to be cutting taxes? Well, I would say the state needs the revenue, but so do Iowans. And when we're talking about tax cuts, we're talking about individual income tax cuts. And there's Iowans out there that are hurting, and we believe they should be able to keep more of their money. And so um, certainly, as Republicans, we're not looking to raise taxes. Um, we see that happening in Illinois, and we see people fleeing Illinois. Um, and, that's not where we're going to go. And you expect federal deductibility phase out to continue then? Yes, that's part of the 2018 bill, and, and right. we expect that to, to trigger at some point, hopefully this year, maybe next year. So looking at the budget more broadly, uh, you mentioned the revenue estimating conference. The December estimates showed that uh, despite this pandemic, state revenue did grow a little bit. The budget actually has a surplus. The cash reserves are full. Should every element within the state budget expect at the very least a status quo if not a little increase or, or is there still the possibility that you may have to trim the fat somewhere, uh, Senator Whitford? Well, I think first of all we need to recognize what you just said about the budget is not normal across the country with surpluses, reserve full, rainy day full, um, and that's because we've made really tough decisions over the last four years and we had a lot of people coming to us say you should spend more, you need to spend more and we were prepared for tough times. We did not know that tough times would be a global pandemic. Nobody knew that, but we were prepared for tough times. And when the pandemic hit, our projected $500 million surplus became 300. But we didn't have to go slash spending across the board in the middle of the year. Um, we wanna continue to be conservative because um, even worse than not giving increases to, to different um, areas is coming midway through the year and saying, I know we promised you increases, but we can't fund it and we're going to take it back. And so um, those tough decisions we've made, we're going to continue to make um, and because we believe we do need to have a surplus. We do believe we need our rainy day fill. That doesn't mean we can't make certain investments. We do have a surplus. If there's investments in things like mental health or other areas that we need to make, we're certainly going to do that through the, the, the budget appropriation process. But um, it's not going to be a free spending session by any means just because those accounts are full. Speaker Gasly, well, and, I, and I would just say from the standpoint of uh, the big, you know, I was here uh, in the legislature when there was a 10% across the board cut under Governor Culver. And I think a lot of us that are still here learn a lot from that. We, we want to be able to fulfill the commitments that we make. So whatever decisions we make on the budget, it's going to be with that in mind, that a commitment we make, we want to make sure that we can keep. We've been able to do that with education funding. We've been able to do that with a lot of the services, even going back to June, trying to keep everything status quo. So that's going to be the driver within our budget. What I've been telling the caucus, and I think our caucus is hearing, there's going to be more requests on the budget than potentially I've ever seen <clears throat> in my time in the legislature. So we have to be consistent with the way that we budgeted because we've left ourselves in this position, like Senator Whitford said, based on those decisions that we've made. 
Speaker Grassley, in mid-December, you said you want education decisions on policy issues to be, um, you know, focused on parents, mm -hmm. um, parental choice. D does that mean that you will be giving parents a state subsidy to send their children to a private school? From my perspective, where I think that House Republicans are going to start is everything is on the table. That would be consistent what I said going back even into earlier in the month. Uh, I think we should start session. Everything's on the table. And when I say that, parental choice and the student choice being involved in that, I think they have been, uh, in a lot of school districts, have been forgotten in these conversations. So from my perspective, where we're going to start is everything on the table. But as we're making these decisions, the driver is going to be making sure that the parent and the student are at the table and have their voices heard. Look back into the election, there was a lot of seats, and I know Senator Whitford could comment on this probably better than I could. There was a lot of districts across the state that uh, I think that they played uh, a huge role. That issue, the fact that parents didn't feel they were even being listened to when it came to returning their student or their children, children into school districts to reopen in person, I think that Iowans spoke loud and clear that that's their expectation. And in, in fact, I think it affected a lot of races in November. Senator Whitford? Do you think that the state should give parents um, tuition assistance to send their child to a private school or a I, parochial school? I, I think that, like the speaker said, that's on the table. Um, when you talk about parental choice, there's a lot of different things that go into that. It's whether can you transfer out of Des Moines public schools or not. It's whether are your kids in school um, five days a week or are they all virtual. It's public-private. So there's a lot of different areas of that conversation when you talk about parental choice, and we're going to have to sort through those. We're going to work close with the governor. We're going to work close with the House. Um, we have one of our strongest members, Amy Sinclair, um, that is in charge of our education committee. We have full faith and confidence in her and her abilities to help navigate um, all these education issues. Uh, but it's everything from funding to in-person or virtual to parental choice. And so there, education is going to be probably the biggest conversation of this entire session. So speaking of the election, um, <clears throat> we had a super close race in the 2nd Congressional District here in Iowa, and, and that shined a light on the recount process there and maybe some concern about inconsistencies or a lack of clarity in state law. Uh, Senator Whitford, I'll start with you on this. Do you expect to see any legislation, debate legislation that would address the state's recount process? Well, I think what the 2020 election told us more than almost anything is election <coughs> law matters and having um, secure elections that people believe in matter. And that's why even back to years ago, we were trying to bring some integrity to our elections to make sure that Iowans have confidence in our elections. And even as late as June and July, we we're trying to make decisions. And I said this on the show in June, the number one thing we need out of our elections is they need to be secure, people need to trust them, and the rules need to be in place um, far enough in advance so both parties know what the rules are. And so we made many changes last year um, in June and then in the Legislative Council to make sure that was the case. I believe in Iowa, um, people did believe in the integrity of the elections. I believe they were secure. Um, there are other issues that popped up, um, like the recount process, that I think we do need to address because um, secure, um, elections that Americans believe in is the foundation of our entire country. That is what America is. And we need to make sure that um, we have full faith in our elections and, and anything um, to clean up the recount process um, we should be looking at. Um, and what some of the auditors did as far as trying to go around the rules with the voter ID absentee stuff, that can't stand either. Um, you can't have eight counties doing one thing and 91 counties doing another thing. It needs to be consistent across the board. And so there will be some cleanup stuff. But overall, our election law is in a really good spot. We've had Robbie Smith, Bobby Kaufman working on that for years, and they're doing a really good job. And again, it's to try to make the playing field balanced for everybody. So, so if it is <clears throat> overall, you talked about maybe some little cleanups. Are overall, so should we not expect anything that significantly <clears throat> changes state election laws, early like, voting, anything along those lines? I think it's too early to tell that. I mean, we give a lot of faith to our committee chairs to work on these. I certainly don't sit around and dictate every little change we're going to make, and they've been working on it. But I think overall, our election laws are pretty good, and um, there are there is a little bit of cleanup we need to do Mr. Though. Speaker, uh, whenever I hear legislators talk about tweaking election laws, uh, I can also imagine that some people don't think it's a tweak, that it's a mm -hmm. massive rewrite. Mm -hmm. It just depends on whose ox is getting gored. Do you, what about what Senator Whitford said? Do you think we need, need to just simply uh, work on the recount issue in the legislature, or do you have I, other things? No, I think at this point in time, I think when it comes to election law, our priority needs to be, and we've seen this for the last several months all across the country, 
is Americans, not one party or the other, I think want to make sure that we have secure, reliable, and safe elections. But specific, and, go ahead. And, and, and to your point specifically, I would say that if, if we have to do, if, we, if things need to be on the table that further advance that so Iowans have faith in their elections, from the House's perspective, I think that needs to be part of the conversation. Do you, either of you expect to make changes to Iowa's absentee law system? Democrats cleaned up with that. They did a better job. They put more emphasis on it than your party. Speaker Grassley, will you be making res more imposing restrictions on absentee balloting? Again, whatever, whatever, at this point, I think it's too early to tell from that, that standpoint. If it brings further faith and confidence in our elections, I think the legislature has a duty to look at those. So, Senator? Restrictions on absentee voting? I, th I think the number one thing that we need to look at with the absentee is, is what the auditors did to try to get around the law. Um, the court shot them down three, four times, um, but it d still doesn't change the fact that they were trying to skirt our absentee law. But the time period, none of that. And, and the reason, to your point, Representative Grassley, a lot of the lack of trust in the electoral system has been caused by um, some elected officials putting out misinformation about the election process. Com making complaints that are completely unverified. So uh, are, are we setting ourselves up to make changes for a problem that doesn't exist? Or I guess that's the, the Well, the I think that I think we heard the same thing when we passed voter ID uh, several years ago. Just this last session, we heard the same complaints when we tried to have an even more secure absentee ballot process. I can't control what other people are saying or what they claim, especially in other states. I think we had a we had record turnout. We had a great election here in Iowa, very safe and secure. But if we need to do more things, uh, that give that security, I think we need to be having those discussions. And it wouldn't be based on anyone's tweet or thing that we read in the newspaper. It's going to be actual things that we hear from Iowans. That's going to be our priority. I would just add that the number one argument we hear at the Capitol on the, de on the debate floor is Republicans are about voter suppression. And that's BS. We had the largest turnout we've ever had. It's about making sure that when the election is over, Iowans believe in the result. And that's what we've been working on. Uh, there's no voter suppression. Uh, we have higher turnout than we've ever had, uh, but they are secure. But Senator, there are 22 <coughs> Democrats, uh, 22 voters in uh, the second congressional district who are concerned that their <laughs> vote in that race for Congress was not counted. They do feel suppressed. I don't, I don't know about those 22 people. I know that has been through a lengthy process for three months, and Senator Miller-Meeks, now Congressman Miller-Meeks, has been seated. And that's the process that's in law, and it's been followed. So when you look at the recount <clears throat> process, would you expect to clean up that sort of situation so that it doesn't happen again? Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're, we're happy to look at all those things, yes. Senator Whitver, on this program last week, uh, viewers saw a discussion about the bottle bill. Yeah. Um, is that something legislators can tackle and make changes, or is it just too complicated? Um, I, I will never admit anything's too complicated to, to <laughs> solve the problem. Um, that's what we do, is try to solve problems. Um, the bottle bill has been around for four, over 40 years now. Um, it has a purpose, it's served a purpose, um, and there are so many different interests and opinions on both sides. This is not one of those, it's a Republican versus Democrat idea. I have people in our caucus that want to pull it out by the roots. I have people that want to raise it to 10 cents. It is a very complicated issue, and so I'm not saying we can't fix it or change it, but um, to your point, it is complicated. I don't know what will happen with the bottle bill this year. Speaker Grassley. All, from my perspective, uh, the number one priority is to make sure that the bottle bill does not go away uh, with the current process that we have. I think it's, it's work. Now, there may be some changes that need to be looked at, and they are every year, back to what Senator Whitford said. Uh, from my perspective, uh, as the, the program has to stay because I think Iowans, and I think it is working in the way it was intended from the standpoint of not seeing them in the ditches and trying to keep them out of the landfills. So from my perspective, that would be the priority. Just a couple minutes. Just a couple minutes and so much to get to. Um, worker safety uh, uh, during the pandemic has been an issue from the start. Uh, you, you, Republicans addressed this a little bit last year with the uh, liability shield for businesses. Um, is there further uh, work to be done on that front and, and uh, weighing um, you know, the, the workers' rights versus trying to keep the food system moving. Uh, Senator, Senator Whitford, we'll start yeah, with you. That's a complicated issue, and during our 12-week break last legislative session, the number one issue that we heard from constituents, um, organizations, different entities, was about how can we get back to normal as quick as possible. And it was churches, it was grocery stores, it was, um, it was food, food um, manufacturing facilities. It was everybody saying, how can we get back to normal? I know in, in my hometown, we had a school that wouldn't allow baseball practices at the park. 
because they weren't sure what their liability might be if, if people got COVID. And so we thought it was very important to bring forward the COVID liability bill just to add some assurance to churches, schools, nonprofits, for-profits that they're not gonna get sued for frivolous lawsuits. Um, if there was negligence, that's still able to be addressed through the court system. And so um, we have what I think is, is probably one of the most strict laws in the country regarding COVID li liability. And I haven't, um, I haven't seen any new changes that we need to make at this time, but it is a strong law that we have in place right now. Speaker Grassley, just a few seconds left. What about this issue of meat worker safety and meat plants? Can we have worker safety and keep the, keep the meat line moving for, for our beef, well, beef and pork producers? Again, to each specific case probably would be handled differently. The bill that we passed does not just grant blanket immunity for everyone. If, if you're a bad actor, the bill that we passed does not give you those protections. And I think like so many other things with COVID, it's going to be an ongoing conversation that happens throughout the entire session. Uh, and as we learn things and hear things that come up, it's just like every other legislative session. It just happens to be with COVID. Gentlemen, time is in essence here too, and I'm out of it. So thank, thank, you. thank you both for being with us. Yeah. Look forward thank to you. having you back. Thank you. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Iowa Press at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night, and again at noon on Sunday. We'll be joined by the lone Democratic member of Iowa's federal congressional delegation, Representative Sidney Axney, on Iowa Press next week. So for all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen. And thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.